Well, hello and welcome everybody to today's In Conversation Masterclass. This is the first time that we've had a panel. So it'd be very interesting to see how that goes. I normally just interview one person about something to do with writing. And today I have got three people who have written and published their memoirs pretty recently. And so I have Joe Weaver, who is in Spain. I have Margaret Gilmetti, who I have now discovered is in Switzerland, but I thought you were in, in America. And Doreen, who is in... I can't remember the name of the place, Doreen. Where are you? I'm in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. So no surprise, I can't remember that. So you are all over the world and I am speaking to you here today from North London. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. The way this is going to work, everybody, is that I'm going to ask, this is because it's a panel, it's the first time I've done it like this. I've got, I have got some questions and everybody's, all three of you are gonna answer the questions one at a time. And so we will just, in order, I will just, because of the order you arrived, I will just ask Joe, then Doreen, then Margaret. Please make your answers as brief as you can because we want to keep this to an hour-ish. The idea is the question and answer session will last for about 40 minutes and then we will open the floor to questions. And so those of you who are listening, please put your questions in the chat box. And do, this is an opportunity for you to talk about yourselves and your book. So I hope you've got a copy of it with you that you can wave. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Doreen's a very good friend of mine. Joe and Margaret I've only met because I discovered last year that they had written books and I have I have read both of them. So and I've read all three of your books. So I hope I can be a bit more helpful with my questions. So I'm going to start with Joe, please. And could you please tell us about your book? Yes, I've got the book here. Good. That's that's the most exciting bit, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I actually live in the Czech Republic, um, I've been there since 1990, just after the revolution, and I've been running a PR agency for about 100 years, and at some point during those 100 years we made enough money to buy a house in Spain, it sort of started off as a summer house and we gradually got sort of a little bit grander and nicer. So last spring, May, no, March 2020, we came down to Spain for a week and at that time they were talking about the lockdown, they were talking about coronavirus, no one knew too much really. We, I have to say, in the Czech Republic didn't know anything, we took no notice of it whatsoever. We got down here to Spain for our usual week a month to sort of chill out and have a nice time in the sun. And when we got here everyone said you must be mad coming here because of this, this bloody virus and we got, we suddenly in the space of a week realised that this is a really serious thing. And on March the 13th, the news came out, no, March the 11th, the news came out that in two days' time, Spain will go into a hard lockdown. At which point we thought, okay, so maybe we'll head back to Prague. And then the same day, that evening, we watched Czech news in the evening and they said they were going to lockdown right now. And we had basically one day to make a decision whether we're gonna go back or whether we're gonna stay here. So to cut a long story short, we stayed and we stayed for 100 days. And on the first day, which was the 13th, I woke up and I don't know, maybe people know about Spanish lockdown, maybe they don't, but this is a real tough lockdown here. We weren't even sure we'd be allowed outside our house. We definitely weren't allowed outside our garden wall, except for once a day, one of us could go to the supermarket. So both me and my husband are athletes, first and foremost. And so the biggest thing that stressed us out was how are we going to do any exercise? How are we going to do anything really except we could work because we had our, our laptop so we sort of okay so we can work but i must say that on the 13th i suffered from a lot of panic attacks that day and my way of dealing with stress always is to write i love to write that's how i got into pr really i, I write all day long every day i write people's websites i write rude articles to the newspaper every day because i'm very political and i thought i'll write a blog i'll write a blog about this terrible lockdown here and what we're going to do to survive it so every day for 100 days I wrote it and it started off that I just sent it to my friends and people that were bringing us and sending messages saying oh god Paul you you're in Spain what's happening and then one of them put it on Facebook and I got about uh, I don't know hundreds of people saying can we follow you on Facebook can we follow this so about into about two weeks I had 2,000 followers every day on my blog 
which then became kind of stress in itself because I felt like every day I've got to write this bloody blog, you know, and then some days there wasn't really an awful lot to say, otherwise, other than it's really boring. And it was raining every day in Spain, you know, everyone said, oh, lucky you, sitting by your pool or in the sun. And we said, well, actually, it's raining every day. Walking to the supermarket just to have exercise was, was miserable because it's raining every day. But we had to find a way, you know, like we all have. And at that time, I think that I thought we might kill each other, potentially. And somehow we have to manage to live together. We've always traveled a lot. We've never really spent more than probably three days together without having a break. You know, he's on the plane, I'm on a plane, whatever. So we had to find ways to entertain ourselves and how to manage our relationship, how to manage everything. And that was the blog, which then at the end of the 100 days, I said, that's enough. And about two months later, various people have been saying to me, where's the blog, where's the blog, where's the blog? Write a book, turn it into a book. So I thought, well, I will. So that's basically, that is my 100 days of being down here with a little bit of adaption along the way. Well, thank and you. I'm that was about now. 25 times longer than I wanted sorry, as an answer. Sorry, so sorry, could you please try and keep your answers shorter <laughs> or we'll be here till tomorrow. Yeah, but I that's like very it. interesting though. And interesting that you started off as a, as a blog and it was an accidental blog and then it became mm. a book. So, and, and marvellous because you'd already got 2,000 people who were following you. So you'd got 2,000 fans. So starting a blog first is a brilliant way to start a memoir. So it was a long story. But it's a very interesting point there. And by the way, when you have turned a blog into a book, it's called as a blook. Oh, a blook. A B-L-O-O. A blook. A blook. Uh, oh, apparently. So, Doreen, could we have your answer about yours? Not as long as yours. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to keep quiet now. <laughs> um, so, this is my book. It's called Life in the Camel Lane, Embrace the Adventure. And it's based on 15 years of living in Saudi Arabia from 1995 till 2010. And um, it's based on stories, um, events, and lessons learned. And I actually call, call it a learn war because although it is a memoir with a lot of insights, it's, all, it's also a lot of life lessons that are baked into it. Mm, I like that, a learnoir. So, so far we've learned Blook and Learnoir, but I like that. I think that should be a new genre. Thank you very much, Doreen. And now Margaret. Okay, I feel some pressure to come up with a new term to describe my book. So I'll be looking forward to your insights once I describe it. Um, first of all, Joe, thank you so much for having us here. I'm really mm -hmm. excited to be here. Uh, my book started out not as a memoir, but after the presidential election in the United States in 2016, with my feeling that we were being told as U.S. citizens that the other is bad. And I've lived on four different continents and visited 50 countries, and my experience is actually that the other is not bad. So I started to write a second solo show using the trip reports that I used to send home to my parents so they would be a part of my journey. And as I wrote, uh, it became clear to me I was writing a memoir. It really surprised me. So is that a word? A surprise? Spring more? A surprise more? I'm not. I'm not sure what my word is to describe my book. <laughs> but it ended up being uh, braiding together the narrator, c'est moi, uh, her literal journey, 20 years living abroad, with her emotional journey, going from being a trailing spouse to coming into her own creative expression somewhat later in life. And that's exactly what you did. Would you please tell us the name of your book? Oh, and thank can you, you show so it? Yes, I'm <laughs> glad I remembered. It is called Brave Ish, a memoir of a recovering perfectionist. I particularly like. I put, <laughs> you're welcome. I particularly like the fact that yours is also a bit of a learnoir because <laughs> you have did t give me a lot of tips about how to get what was perfectionism, particularly <laughs> in the context of being a let's call her an accompanying partner or him or her an accompanying partner rather than um, a trailing spouse. Let's give, let's give it a positive spin. Um, <laughs> But um, yes, the perfectionism that comes with that, that does, particularly when you are partner of somebody really important and you feel you have mm -hmm. to embrace that role too. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I got a lot out of yours. So I think yours is a learnoir as well, actually. And it was, oh, and it, but there's, there's because along the way, what you did was you, you taught us subtly how we too could find ourselves and learn to express ourselves when maybe we have felt like we are a chattel, 
So I think you did a very good job. Thank you. That. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. Thank you. Thank so you. now I want a very quick answer. Um, that's going to be quick. I want to know how long it took you to write it. So we, we know that Joe's took 100 days to write, but then from the, the day it was written, then how long till it was out? So I want to know how long it took to write and then how long it took from when it was finished, the manu first draft was finished, until it was out, just to show people what the reality of that can be. So I'll start with Joe. Yeah, well, I'm not probably a good example because I regret it a bit, but I... I finished the 100 days, that was in June. In October, I decided I'm going to do it. But if I'm going to do it, I make it into a book. I, I need to do it soon because I foolishly thought that we will never see this again. And mm. soon everything's going back to yeah. normal. So I really, I wanted to get it out by Christmas and I got it out by Christmas because I thought that my, my followers would buy it for Christmas, which some did. And that by January, it would be probably, you know, it wouldn't be that relevant mm. anymore. I was wrong. I said, I regret it a lot. I mean, I regret doing it so fast. There were so many things I would have done differently and I will do differently in the future. Oh, interestingly, interesting. So yeah. Doreen, what about you? You're muted at the moment, Doreen. Um, my book was written over a period of about uh, 10 years. Wow. <laughs> I got the idea in 2011 and the title arrived 2011. Um, I started, um, interviewing other women who were on the Saudi journey with me uh, in through 2012 to 2014, but I was only doing it sporadically. And then in 2016, my husband and I discovered a whole fun new lifestyle called pet and house sitting across the globe. And so I was writing this book in Brussels, Spain, Colorado, Canada, I mean, it was very disjointed, partly because of the geographical situation and all the moving we were doing. I finally got my arms around it in France, in the south of France on January 2018, which is when I hired my fabulous editor. And finally, I published it in 2020. It was supposed to be to a grand opening with a real camel, and um, it ended up being uh, a digital launch on Zoom like this uh, from Mexico. Wow, my goodness. So that's so, so we've got Joe at one end of the spectrum and you at the other. So anybody in between is normal. And what about you, Margaret? Oh, I'm normal. How, how thrilling. I never <laughs> came to that before. I'm firmly in the middle between Joe and Doreen. So as I say, the idea came to me in 2016. Then once I realized, oh, it looks like it's maybe a memoir, I took a course called Memoir in a Year at Story Studio in Chicago, which was very helpful. I ended up hiring the instructor from that to be my writing coach, who is, I would not have wanted to do this book without mm -hmm. her. Uh, and then I signed with uh, She Writes Press in 2019. I did not tell She Writes Press that I had not written the book. So that's when I uh, don't tell that, don't ever tell them that I did not write the book mm -hmm. I said I'd written. And then I, I hustled and finished writing the book in 2019 and it was published this September of 2020. So I'm in between you two. But you know, that was great by telling, by selling the book before you'd written it. I mean, nothing can be a better kick in the bum, can it really? So well It was done. definitely, it was definitely a motivator. You're yes, right. uh, I like that. That's a motivator mm -hmm. I, I haven't done myself. My motivator was I would always tell people that my book would be for sale in the bookshop of a conference. And so <laughs> then good. I had to write it and get it out. And I did that. Well, I've written 32 books, so I haven't done it 32 times, but I've certainly done mm -hmm. it about 20 times because I need that kick up the bum too. But it works because <laughs> otherwise we all put it off, don't we? Marvellous. Um, so um, for a book to have legs, as I call it, it has to inspire, support, inform, or entertain, or a mixture of them. So, um, Michael, you've come back on the camera. Could you disappear again, please? Don't know how you did that. Um, so, uh, what about what about you, does Joe? Does yours inspire, support, inform, or entertain? Well, I hoped it would actually. I mean, I didn't in the beginning because the first few days was kind of. Well, how, you know, how, we how we're coping with it. But I thought that it might, first, 
I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a joker, really, so I'd like to make it as funny as possible. That, that was my, that was, the main thing was to try and be funny so people would read it and giggle, and that, was, that was, made me happy. But also, that I felt that we were sitting in, in Spain in this horrible lockdown, and, but we were watching Czech, and we are watching England, because that's where I come from. And we had like three TV screens with each of the, each of the countries all day long, all the news and so on. And I'm quite a political sort of person anyway. So I was writing quite a lot of how the politics are working in the three different countries. So I felt like that was kind of hopefully a bit informative because I could see that they were all telling such rubbish about each other, you know, that, that it wasn't anywhere near how they talked about Spain or how they talked about England. It was so different. And um, so I thought it was quite, I hoped it was informative. I hoped it was entertaining because I like to sort of, you know, joke about things and joke about myself and being a bit of an idiot sometimes. And inspiring, I suppose that my long-term dream, actually, when I retired from PR was to be a, a personal trainer for ladies. And I, I studied it a bit to be able to, once I gave up the serious work, to sort of inspire ladies of a certain age to get fit. Right. When you were, so when you were writing it, were you conscious that you were trying to do those for your Inspire, Support, Inform and Entertain? I think I was after a while. Hmm. In the beginning, I mean, that, and that was really about the feedback. I mean, that's the difference, I suppose, with a blog and a book, you know, that every day I was getting feedback. So I got people emailing me, you know, end of it. So it became a full-time job, really. And so the feedback that I got, when people kept writing to me saying, I mean, I had people saying to me, sorry to sound sort of boastful, but people say to me, this is the only thing that keeps us through the day. <laughs> we, we're waiting for your blog to come every evening. You know, it was really nice. So I felt like I, I need to keep that going. I need to keep the things that they're talking about. I need to keep them going. You know, that's, it's almost like that's what, that's what people are wanting. So I must try and do, keep, not, keep those four things. I didn't realise they were those four things until you told me, Joe. But, oh. but, <laughs> but I did, you know, sort of subconsciously try to be a bit inspirational. I definitely, I was talking to some friends in London about how to stay fit when they couldn't go outside their flat. And these things I sort of developed a bit outside of the blog too. So I felt like it was mm -hmm. uh, inspiration and if I could, you know, it's a big word, isn't it? Well, good for you. Good for you. That sounds great. Sometimes when you joke and you can be funny, um, and the way you tell a story, it's all down to your voice. And sometimes a voice is the entertainment element of a memoir. So if you just can, a really nice writer with a really entertaining style that can carry it. So what about you, Doreen? Inspire, support, inform or entertain? Well, I'd like to um, give you a quotation to start with that answer. Uh, this is from Arnie Erno. I don't know who that is. But they said, maybe the true purpose of my life is for my body, my sensations, and my thoughts to become writing. In other words, something intelligible and universal, causing my existence to merge into the lives and heads of other people. Mm -hmm. oh, that's nice. And I love that quote because I really felt like that was what I was doing with life in the camel lane. Um, I believe that I was very motivated to inspire people because I'm a natural inspirer. I'm a coach at heart. Um, and I really love to help people move through transition and use travel as a tool, not as an end result, but as a tool to become, uh, have a, one, a more wonderful life or whatever life the, the listener or reader wants. So I really felt like inspiration was part of it. Support, not so much. Um, of course, I wanted to nurture people on the overseas journey. I wanted to help them through liminal living and living in between different spaces, different cultures, different concepts. Um, inform, I definitely wanted to cover inform. The country of Saudi Arabia in itself is one of the most misunderstood, misjudged, and mistaken places geographically, I believe, on the planet. And I wanted to show the heart, the joy, the love, the Saudi women asking you if, if, how often I had sex and, and where, because all they knew was what they saw from TV drama in America. So they just think that we're bunny rabbits or something in, Amer in the West. And so I wanted to share some of those moments with the reader in order that they could really get under the skin and into the hearts of the real Saudi Arabia. So that was a very high intention. Entertain, 
I'm not sure I did that so well. Um, I think part of the descriptions I think are, are entertaining. And I do think that if I were to write this book again, it would be very different, but it would still have Inspire as my number one go-to um, motivator. I believe that I would write to inform, support third, and entertain last. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do all four. Entertainment, no, you don't have to, you only have to, you have to make sure you do at least one of them. You don't have to do all four. But what can really help with entertaining apart from voice is the stories that you tell. And so that can really carry a memoir as well. Uh, lovely answer, Doreen. What about mm -hmm. you, Margaret? Uh, I just want to say that was a fantastic question for me because I love to work with other memoirists and storytellers and I had never really seen those four different legs. Um, I would say since I came to writing the book from a very strong storytelling sort of mentality, I had learned to see that the stories that really touch people when I tell for a live audience are when I make myself vulnerable and I use my sense of humor, which is pretty uh, low key. I'm not someone you don't look at me and think I'm going to be a laugh riot, but I do like to kind of, I like to laugh at myself, as Joe said, and I think audiences generally appreciate that. But I really came from it from when I shared about infertility, um, when I shared about caregiving for my parents at the end of their lives, um, when I shared about being an expatriate uh, like Doreen, it was really important for me to, for people to understand the places that I'd lived with affection because a lot of people say, oh my God, how did you manage to live in? And I said, well, my experience was, was, was wonderful, but it was life. So I would say I really went into it wanting to inform people about living on four continents, wanting to support people who had, were going through or knew someone who had gone through what I had experienced, uh, life challenges. Um, I definitely ended up wanting to inspire people with it's never too late to live our own lives. That's, that's the arc of the story. That only revealed itself to me as I was writing. And the entertaining, as I say, that's always fun for me. I feel if I can make someone laugh, mm -hmm. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. um, I loved what you started off with there, Margaret, because you talked to, about being vulnerable. And being vulnerable is, I think, key to every memoir, to show what you find difficult and to show your struggle. And to, and, but a memoir has to have an upbeat ending. So um, we want to see the struggle, but we want to see, see how you got over it. So great that you were able to do that. It's not always easy to, uh, to lay yourself bare on the page like that. But uh, I, I think you've been incredibly honest in your memoir and so much of it resonated with me. And that's what we're aiming for with the memoir um, is that we want your story to resonate with the reader. Not all of the memoir, not, all, not every aspect necessarily, but some pieces to resonate. And so many of your stories resonated with me. So, um, so I think it worked on those levels too, which aren't in my list of four, but they're sort of embedded within it. Um, so I also say that a memoir must have three elements. I call them pearls, as in pearls on a necklace. There's, the pearls are the stories or the scenes. So think of a necklace and you've got the stories or the scenes. And the moment you've got stories, you've got entertainment. So you've got the stories and so you string them on your necklace. And I call those the pearls. And then you've got the themes and you've all talked about the themes. We've talked about the politics in Joe's. We've talked about um, teaching people about the reality of Saudi and Doreen's. And we know that in Margaret's we've got infertility and we've got um, perfectionism. So you've got those themes and those themes pop up intermittently. So sometimes I might sound a bit odd, but on your necklace, the pearls aren't all exactly the same color and sort, same size and same shape because they are, they change because of the themes that are, that are used. But with the thing with the theme is it doesn't pop up once, it pops up intermittently. So you've got to make sure you have the theme several times. And then you have to have the, what I, well, it's not what I call, everybody calls the red thread. And the red thread is the main theme that runs through the whole arc of the book. Mm -hmm. And because you have to have these stories and you have to have the themes, and you have to have the red thread. That means that you can't keep everything in your book 
just because it happened it can't stay there so what did you do I mean for Joe this is probably a ridiculous question because you could only write about what happened because you hadn't got anything to do <laughs> but how did you go about let's ask you how did you go about what they call murdering your children and deciding what you can leave out of yours um well I didn't as I was doing the blog I did once I started to turn it into the book and then, and then I realised, because I hadn't been writing it as a, something that was going to connect with it all the way through, you know, every day was a different day. And mm. so what I realised is I was terribly repetitive when I, when I, when I went to the first run through afterwards and wanted mm. to remove stuff. I realised that, God, I kept on going on about the same thing over and over again. You know, that's, that was okay as a blog, but on the book mm. it would be very boring for someone to read it through. Mm. So I sort of took a lot of the repetitiveness out some of the rude bits, you know, because I wasn't mm. expecting, I, I kind of knew virtually who were reading the, the book, the blog each day, but if it was a book, I had to be a bit careful, not, I didn't want to get sued. So I was quite rude about Boris Johnson, for example, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think it was different for me, really, because I, you know, I didn't want to change it too much because it was mm. supposed to be this hundred days of lockdown. My oh. best friend kept saying to me, well, lie, you know, make it more entertaining by lying. And I didn't really want to do that. I'm doing it this time, though. <laughs> so yours you for you it was it was perhaps a bit different but for Doreen who spent 15 years I, I think you said living in Saudi Arabia you had so much you could decide to keep in and leave out so how did you make those selections knowing that you've got to keep your red thread and your theme this was my first large book I had been uh, published before and I had written another book on the subject of repatriation which I'm an expert in supposedly <laughs> And it was called Arriving Well. And I had written that with three other coaches and we had people submit. So when it, I made the mistake, I made so many mistakes with this memoir that it, it, it chagrins me at this point. I had too much in there. I tried to get my arms around too much. There were so many stories. I could have gone down the lane of just reporting um, all my colleagues' stories and the little lessons from that. But no, Doreen wanted to include, oh, we've got to have the inspiration piece and we have to build in this. So it was ultimately my editor and my book coach and my editor who cut a lot of the words. And I actually have over 110,000 words that were not used in my book. Wow. That tells you how much I wrote. And that now informs me of the fact that I can write and that I need to be, and how selective, and, and it's a different thinking process now that I'm in compared to back then. So I have to say that paring it down and niching, 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 I think is probably the way I will go forward from now on. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Sometimes we, there are no mistakes, only learning. Your book is, is a great read. I know why you said what you said. What you said, there is a there is an awful lot in it, and often we want to put things in because they were great and they mean something and they are relevant. But you know, the longer a book is, the more pages it has, and the more pages it has, the more you should sell it for, but you can't sell it for. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. how many pages? I have two hundred and eighty-eight pages, not including the additional resources and and all the stuff at the back. And how many hundred thousand words is that? I mean, you know, I'm not sure. I honestly, I noticed that question. I'm guessing, uh, I think it's probably between 75 and 85,000 words. I think it's probably closer to 90 with that many pages, to be honest. Yeah, so it's a... This should be four books. This should be a series of four books is what I believe now. And especially with um, uh, people's attention span and what they can you know, download and handle and, and in their minds. I mean, if I really mm. want to make a difference, then I think I, I, in future, I need to pare it down, be very specific and deliver one or two or three messages, not 15. But it's interesting that you've said that and you've been so honest and I thank you for your honesty, but you've, you've, been, you've won awards and you've won, you've won things, haven't you? I have. <laughs> yeah, so tell, what, what did you win? Um, I, I won an award with the uh, California Independent Publishers Association and uh, it was an award for the, I think it was in the editing category. <laughs> 
So they showed them a piece of the before and then a piece of the published. And that's what the book won an award for because the editor was the one that took 100,000 words away and killed them. <laughs> <laughs> you are so honest. I do applaud you, Doreen. Thank you so much for your honesty. But these masterclasses are there to teach the people who are listening. So thank you very much for embracing that as well. Thank you very much, Doreen. So what about you, Margaret? Uh, well, I love that Pearl's idea. As I say, I started off having written tons and tons of these trip reports. So I was lucky I had a lot of raw material. Uh, someone suggested the word processing program called Scrivener, which honestly saved mm. my oh, life because I was able to dump everything into Scrivener chapters. And as you say, once I realized my themes were the two themes, the literal and the emotional journey, and that I was trying to braid those together, and I knew where I wanted to go, um, I had the red thread of my turquoise journal, which I'd been carrying since a child. Would I ever, would the protagonist, is she ever going to write the doggone book? Oh, she, oh no, she's not going to write the book. So I love that red thread idea. So I had a lot of raw material, about 700 pages worth in binders that I was carrying around the world with me. And I did, I started to kill a lot of darlings because what I kept saying was, does this move the narrator's journey forward? So if it didn't, it went into a, not luckily a delete file, but Scrivener has this neat way you can keep stuff for your next book. And I had gotten great advice from my solo show coach saying, you do not have to put everything into one book. You have many, many books in you, which you all have actually published more books. Um, I was feeling panicky. I have to put everything in this book. And she said, no, no, you need to not put everything in this book. You need to move the narrator on her arc. And that's how I cut and cut and cut and cut. So I got it down to 244 pages, which is about 80,000 words. Hmm. Great. Thank you very much. No, it's great, isn't it? This cutting, cutting can make, it always makes a story better. It always makes a book better. It's amazing. You can go through and just cut out all the that's because they don't do anything. And you can cut out all the reallys and actuallys and verys and they don't do anything. It's amazing how many words you can get rid of just by doing that. And it's, it's, it's nearly always stronger for taking words out. So... So thank you all very, very much for your honesty there. So um, my, my next question was going to be, how did you construct your book? But I know we know how Jo has constructed her book. So can you tell me how many thousand words you have in each chapter? Me? Yes, you, Jo. Tell me. <laughs> um, well, I'm a bit shocked that my book, I didn't actually realize, the book is actually over 300 pages. And yeah, and I remember what you said at the time about making it shorter. And like I said before, I mean, I have lots of regrets about rushing it. So I, I, if I had my life again, I would make it much shorter. Um, I can't tell you how many day, words there are in each chapter, a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of, you know, I mean, it, the blogs themselves gave me so much pleasure just writing them and it was quite difficult to then kind of think of them in a different way I mean if I had my life again I would turn it into a book as you suggested Joe. actually mm -hmm. like, like, take it away from being a, a sort of me talking all day long and have much more conversation and so on and, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah it's too long it's, I can see that well thank you very much for your honesty well what about you Doreen you constructed the chapters in a in a very different way you work because you you did more with them so what what do you think was your process you're muted, Doreen. I, I divided the book up really into uh, subjects. And there's basically five sections. I'm trying to remember what they are. <laughs> but there's five sections to the book. And they're on actual subjects that I love writing about. Um, as, a, as a serial expat, lived on you know, nine countries over four decades. Um, I really wanted to hit the high points of a journey. And so that started with the, you know, waking up in a new place, the adaptation process, the liminal living, the new paradigms and how to change your paradigms, and then the re-entry part. And I think that the next book I write might be similar to that because those are really my... Um, silos this is what i speak about what i teach about what i coach about and i just can't see me moving out of that 
it's it's absolutely ingrained in who I am. So that's what I that's the five sections of the book, and within each section there are chapters with examples, and I try to take the reader from the idea or a description of a of a situation to a lesson at the end of every chapter. Hmm. Which is actually more how-to than memoir, which is why you've done a learn -war. But then, Doreen, you are a mistress of, inv of inventing wonderful phrases and words, so I will, I will keep that. I think you should trademark it. It's just very good. I really like it. I really like it. But yes, the, the, you've made a very important point there. You are a coach. You do speak and train on these issues, and your book should work for you. It, exactly. Otherwise, what's the point? And if these are your themes, why not use them again? There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And it does help you to stay focused, which is what I call the F word. Um, and it keeps helps to keep you within these niches, which you talked about earlier. So um, I completely approve of that. I think it's a very sensible thing to do. What about you, Margaret? Uh, well, mine really was uh, perhaps more classic in that it's chronological. I started off with a prologue once I realized my central organizing principle is the Davis Family Handbook. Davis is my maiden name. So mm -hmm. I wanted to set up that the narrator was taking with her as an, a new expatriate a lot of rules that she then turned into roles when she felt completely lost and bewildered uh, without a professional identity. So I wanted to set context and then I wanted to jump in immediately to our first overseas assignment. So, and then I went by assignment. So it was easy for me to go to France and then to go to uh, e Egypt and then to Thailand, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for me to go chronologically. I had a specific sort of sidebar for India because India was so important to me, even though we didn't live there. So I needed it to have a lot more space than it did technically. Um, and then I do at the end a revision of the Davis Family Handbook. So I had an easy journey. It was really chronological with flashbacks. I think that your book is a great example, Margaret, of a book that somebody could take and unpick and see what you've put in it because you've got lots of you've got your turquoise journal you've got the davis family handbook you've got the perfectionism it's very clear very clear blocks um and uh yeah i think i i, I commend you for that because it's very cohesive your book the way the way it works i very good so i this was an, it's a digression from the questions i was going to ask so you said you worked with the person who ran this memoir in a year course um, yes. How much input do you think she she had? Because uh, Doreen's oh. talked about her editor, and you've talked about your person. So, how much time did she spend on your book? Oh, thank God for editors, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I love to edit other people's work. I think I'm probably a pretty good editor of other people's work, but I don't know about anyone else. It's very hard to edit our own work. We get very very close to it, and mm -hmm. it's close to our hearts. Um, so this woman was fantastic as both a developmental editor. I had three people I worked with as developmental editors to help me really find the arc and find the themes uh, and weed out a lot of things. Uh, and then I didn't so much need her, I would say on technical stuff, but she was very good at helping me with suggesting gently what to cut, uh, what to move, what to add. That's her sort of in the revision process. That was very, very helpful to me. I would not have wanted to do this book without her. I would say primarily though, because she was an incredible cheerleader. When I was really losing heart, she would say to me, I get it. You're on the ground. I'm in the treetop. I can see it coming together. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Or when I was writing about my parents and all I did was cry for days mm -hmm. on end and she would say, stop writing about your parents for a while. So she was a fantastic on an emotional level, I'd say as much as anything. And then I was very happy She Writes Press insists on a professional proofread that they do. And that was also really informative because I think I write fairly well, but it's uh -huh. really good to proofread your book. 
Yeah, it's interesting there. So I, you I had to want to do it without all these experts. Yeah, helping. So, so the, you, there's the de developmental editor, there's the uh, copy editor, and then there's the proofreader. And Dor I'm going backwards now, but I just thought well, while we're on this theme, Doreen, you used a number of people because I came to one of your many online book launches and you had a lot of people there that you thanked. Who, can you remind us who you had on your team? Well, number one, I had uh, Polly Latowski from um, My Word Publishing, and she really taught me the basics of uh, hybrid self-publishing. So having a, how to set up my own printing um, little, I've forgotten the name of it, it's a beautiful little, you know, how to set up your, your own printing company, which really protects your, the, the rights for the book and you own the book forever. And so she taught me all of that. And then Alexandra O'Connell was actually the editor, but she did some coaching also at the beginning. And then she hired the proofreader. And then the amazing Victoria Wolf, who I just love. Um, she and I had so much fun working on the cover. And the cover actually is a story in itself because the whole community in Saudi Arabia got together on the cover. This is a photograph by a friend of mine. She's standing up there. And um, the mosaic I will be using as my branding from now on because I believe that our lives are always mosaics mm -hmm. and we piece them together a bit at a time. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, those are all the people that I had helping me. Basically a team of four uh, or five people. Wow. Oh wow! And then Joe, you talked about all your re your your readers who were gave you feedback. Who else did you have in your team? Me. You. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it, I felt. I, th I think it's just because of the time. I mean, I was so obsessed mm. with sort of. If, I had never planned this to be a book. I've always wanted to write a book, but I hadn't planned this to be mm. the book. And so I didn't really, when I decided that I'm okay, everyone's telling me to do it, so I'll do it. Then I've got to do it quickly, like I said. So, and that's my job. I mean, I spend most days editing and reading and writing stuff for people. So I felt like, well, I can do it. But I agree that editing your own work is much more difficult. And so I still look at it and think, oh God, that was rubbish, you know. And, and I'm sure that somebody else would have looked at that and said that was rubbish and stopped me having to feel like that now. So I mine was all about speed. So that's what I've learned. So to, you know, it, it's a difficult one because of the what's going on. I mean, if it hadn't been for wanting to rush it through in order to still be COVID relevant, then I wouldn't have probably hurried as much as I did. But I would definitely tell people, you know, taking a bit more time and not being too anxious about getting it published. I mean, I never did it to make money. I just did it because I, I just thought, well, I'll do it and that would be fun. And it was. But now I'd like to do it again better, you know. And that's shown a huge amount of bravery that you did. And so what I would just like to ask, the next question I have is what was your biggest mistake and what would you definitely do again? So you've just told us what you think your mistake was, Joe. What would you do again? I would definitely work with somebody like you, actually. I mean, I, th I think that it's very easy to, and probably, you know, I read like James Patterson, for example. He's the most prolific writer in the world, isn't he? But he, write, he works with lots of other people. And I think that... I want to, I am writing books now, you know, and I, but eventually when I get to the point when I'm ready to sort of show it to somebody else, I would definitely like to get other people involved, even if it's just to give it to, you know, I had friends saying to me, we'd read it before you publish it, even though they've read the blog. And I'd say, no, I want to get it out, get it out, you know, and, and now I think that was silly. I should have let them read it and they would have picked up a lot of the things that I now look at and think that wasn't so good. But it was a good learning, you know, and I, I, I don't know whether when the books actually arrived in Spain, a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. you know, that was enough for me. I just looked at that and thought, wow, that's a, that's a book. That's great. You did it. Yeah. You did it far. Yes. Uh, what, did you do, what did you do right? What do you think you did right that you would do again? I think that I met the four th things that you talked about and that I it was sort of like subconsciously you kind of knew. I mean, I've, I've written millions of websites. And I'm very critical with clients, how, how they write their website. You know, that everyone says they're great. They're not going to say they're rubbish, are they? You know, these sort of things, how you've got to really be, um, not always get too into yourself too much, you know, and, and bear these things in mind, what, what people reading it want to read rather than what you want to write. And that's what I tell people with websites. And I think that I managed that sort of. I didn't always write what I wanted to after the first couple of weeks. I write, wrote much more for the people that are reading it. 
Mm. So I think I sort of met the Inspire support in full entertain points. Um, so I'm pleased about that. I'm mm. pleased I did it, you know. And I think it's a, what it's done is made me want to write many more books. And I don't really want to do PR anymore, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you that very much good. for your honesty there. So what about you, Doreen? What did you get right and what did you get wrong? Well, I know I got the cover right. <laughs> And the layout, yeah. the presentation, and and I think the the topics. And what I got wrong was in not making it more of a how-to book, because it really is a how-to book. And probably um, depending on some of the uh, other people's stories too much, instead of my own story. However, having said that. Um, I'm very satisfied that I published a book and everything I write from now on now has the perspective of what do I want my legacy to be. So it has really um, been a gift to me and a huge lesson. And as I continue to work with Jujo and other people to study and, and learn about writing, I don't think I'm a, a natural writer. I'm a natural speaker. I love to speak. And so it's a question of learning how to um, listen to what I'm saying and record it and then write it down. <laughs> so it's a long <laughs> process for me. I'm just not, uh, I don't have that kind of brain. My brain is like an advertising agency brain. It comes up with slogans and ideas and concepts like that, but it doesn't necessarily have the literary studiousness that it needs to translate that beautifully and take one like Christine does here on, you know, cavorting through the words of the page so that the reader ends up in some fabulous playland. I don't have that yet. Thank you very much for your honesty as well, Doreen. That's great. And what about you, Margaret? I like your yet. That's very inspiring <laughs> to me. Um, I'll start with what I feel that I did right is uh, what we were just talking about. I hired some people to help me which is a big part of the book too, is I started off not realizing that I needed help, not realizing that I could ask for help, not realizing I could accept help. That's the advice I would give to my younger self. And that's really the journey of the narrator is learning to uh, ask for help and to accept help. So I'm grateful that I knew to get help in finishing this book. And I also feel what I did right was I finally committed and announced to the world that my book came first and that for a people pleaser was very very hard to do but it was uh great that i was getting older as we all are but you know i really started to realize the clock is ticking it's it's really now or never so that was something i did right um what i the mistakes i made is i didn't run passages by a couple of friends until just before i handed it in and that was not intentional but I thought I was being honest without being a, in an expose mode. And a few friends, someone did ask that question in the chat bar, did ask me not to lie, but just not to talk about some things in the countries where they still live. They said, you know, we're still living in some of these places and we have to deal with some of these officials. And so um, I have some very funny stories that I cut because I didn't want them to feel hurt. Uh, not realizing how hard it is to write a book. I've wanted to do this since I was a little girl, so I thought this would be easier. And not taking care of myself physically along the way. I really, really ran myself down for a good, good purpose. But even my doctor said to me at some point, you are not understanding with your salads every day. You need carbohydrates. She said, go home and eat a pizza. So you know I'm in love with my doctor. Uh, but I really needed to learn to take care of myself. My eyes were starting to bug out of my head and my neck, you know, hunched over the computer. And so there was a lot of, it's, it's hard, harder than I thought it was. Mm. Yes, Dorian. May I add something to that? Margaret, I so feel for you because living in Saudi Arabia, we had uh, huge situations like alcohol is illegal. And of course we all made it. We, some people had skills and they made it. <laughs> And I had to, I recently had to write an entire blog on 
what was not in the book in order that I could protect and be diplomatic to the entire Aramco community of thousands of expats who are still there. And it was a very fine line. I kind of brought it in at the end, but so I, I really understand that. And I think there is a sense of responsibility for the expat writer in um, not just spewing out facts, but in actually consciously and handling the material that we're sharing. Mm. Mm. Excellent, excellent, excellent answers. So just before we open to, the, to, end, to more questions on the floor, um, can you please tell us what your websites are or where people can find you, more about you and your books? And can you also type them in the chat bar? So Joe. Well, mine, I have, what well, was my company's website was now my website, which is uh, JWA, J for Joe, W for Weaver, A, dot CZ for Czech. And that's really where I have most stuff. Uh, my blog goes on there every day and I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Facebook. I'm Joe Weaver also on Facebook because I use Facebook to promote the book. Okay, so if you've just put your website into the chat bar as well. Thank you, Joe. What about you, Doreen? Where can people find you? I have a website. It's just my name. It's Doreen, D-O-R-E-E-N-M, Cumberford. Sounds like it's, spells like it sounds, C-U-M-B-E-R-F-O-R-D.com. And then I have a page on Facebook, which is Life in the Camel Lane. And you can also find me on Facebook at Reentry Rockstars, which is the, um, the returning page. And if, you know, if anyone's interested in pet and global house sitting, I have Life in the House Sitting Lane, which is going to be the book after the one I'm working on. <laughs> and Doreen knows so much about the house sitting lane. You have so inspired me. I so want to do it one day. So yes, please write all those down in the chat bar, Doreen. Uh, and you, Margaret. Oh, Mar and Margaret. Oh, so you're all Margaret Gilmetti. It's easy. Right. So I, well, it uh, is, except I can't spell it. I, no one can. That's why I asked. <laughs> I'm glad, grateful that you asked us to write it down. So my website is www, my first and last names, which you can see on the chat bar or under my picture, uh, dot com. So that's, uh, I'm easy. And that's where I am. I love, love, love Instagram. So anyone who wants to be my Instagram friend, please follow me. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. So now we'll I'll go back and see what questions we've received in the chats. Um, and then when we get to the end of this lot of chats and, 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 and any more, I will turn the recording off and you can turn your cameras on and have a proper chat if you would like to. So... Um, Monty likes Learn Moir and Bloch. Yes, I, I like Learn Moir. Um, Monty says, to, as to Doreen's point, yes, there are still many countries in the Middle East that only judge the outside world from what they see on TV. So she's thanked you there. Uh, Christine has asked, did you all use Scrivener? Uh, we've done a couple of uh, In Conversation masterclasses with Anne Rainbow about Scrivener. So you can go and watch those if you want to know more about it. The one about using Scrivener is particularly uh, useful. And then there was one about in memoir, about memoir and story arcs and red threads and pinch points, which is also really interesting, which you can go and find. But did you, so Margaret used Scrivener. Did anybody, anybody else use it? No, Joe hasn't. No, I would though. I like to, I'm going to look into it. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I've had clients who have worked with it. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie Pendlebury wants to know if a learn more will earn more. That's a bit of a <laughs> tongue twister. <laughs> I think a learn more, I wonder, I think if the, I, not all of them, but for me, I like it if a memoir is a learn more. I really like to be able to learn something. I certainly learned from Doreen's book and, for, and from Margaret's. So uh, that's, I like that, but ha ha, be very funny. Um, Michael wants to know that we've been talking about writing selfie memoir, but um, is, do, the, do, you, do you have any thoughts on whether the same thing would apply if you were writing a memoir of someone else? So an autobiography of someone else? I mean, I, I have given that some thought, Michael, and um, I think uh, I would have to make up a lot because I've considered writing a, small, a short story even on my, my personal, my dad's um, life history. 
I think it would be very different, very difficult, and I think you can draw conclusions, but the, it doesn't have the rawness or the magnetic factor for me to write someone else's story, much as I love the story. Um, but I feel like I need the inside out perspective because that's the lens with th through which I see life. And for people who write other people's biography, I just think that's the greatest gift and I celebrate that there are people out there who can do that. Yeah, I think it's an extremely difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's one thing to be trying to write a, um, a memoir as a ghostwriter for somebody else, who's somebody who's alive and you can ask them lots of questions, but it's another thing to write a memoir about someone who's dead. Um, one memoir that I thoroughly enjoyed is called The Colour of Water by James McBride, in which he tells his story and he tells his mother's story. And I think he does a really super job there. Um, but I don't personally have that many tips, except that what I do know is that if I would interview everybody who knew that person, if there's anybody still alive, and I would probably find that even if it was the same story, they would all have a different angle on it. So it makes, and they say that all memoir is fiction because it's all seen through our own lens anyway. And so um, I don't see how any of us can be sure we'd get it right, writing, the, writing somebody else's story, but we can only do our best and do as much research as possible. Um, so Christine asked Margaret how your family reacted to you writing about your parents. And in general, how do you manage relationships with other family when writing about family members? That's a wonderful question. Um, my parents were both deceased by the time the book came out, but I think we had done a lot of growing up together. So I think they would have been fine with it, quite honestly. Something really magical that came out of the book is when my, I have three older brothers, when they read about the Davis Family Handbook, it really resonated for them and it has allowed us to actually have a much deeper relationship because they saw that I saw that we all, each of us inherit some rules from our parents. They're meaning the best for us, I'm sure of that. But it does uh, create a paradigm that we all sort of operate from. And so it's been really lovely. A lot of people have asked me, how has my husband reacted? Because I'm very honest about my marriage with Patrick. And I did make sure to read every single word that had anything to do with Patrick before I hit send. Not for him to change anything, but to make sure he felt I was being truthful. And he did, so that, that helped a lot. But I was really careful. I was never setting out to write an expose, but for some people it is, people have told me it's, it's very vulnerable. I do talk about a lot of things but i try to talk about my things not someone else's mm, very good issues point. Mm. very good point i would just like to make a few comments on this um when i wrote monday morning emails i wrote about a number of people including both my sons one of my sons said he didn't want to be in it and i had to cut him out after i'd written it and the other son said i'm very happy to be in it i want to go through and embellish it and add more because my <laughs> he'd, he'd had a, a healing journey and he wanted to make sure his healing journey was as accurate as as possible from his perspective so that's what he did and then i i showed my husband all the bits with him in as well so i think it is very important that you can do that the other thing you mentioned margaret was about the relationship with your brothers since um i run a program called life story jar where people can uh, be prompted to write about stories from their past and i have had a number of mothers and daughters i've got one mm. one one woman and her mother and her brothers have all done the same course so they all end up writing about the same things and then they can share which has been a really nice bonding thing if anybody wants to go and try a trial lesson and do it with some family members and you go just go to joeparfit.com and there's a life story jar tab and you can download a free taster session so that's something you could do um Monty says you couldn't find any on social media. I don't know what you mean, Monty, if you couldn't find... Oh, you couldn't find Joe Weaver on social media. How's your name written on Facebook? 
perhaps you could add the link there, Joe, into the into the chat box. Well, uh, yes, and on your website. Yes, I don't think you've put that in yet. <laughs> Um, Sam wants to know how you all organize your time between writing and doing other things every day. Sam is a Bikram yoga teacher, so he's got to try and fit that in with his life. So how did you manage to get the balance in there? I'll start with Joe. Oh, I found it, I mean, even just with a blog, it started to take off my, take over my day a bit. And I found it quite stressful, you know, because I was... So having like my normal life, this I wasn't giving up everything to write this blog. I had to do my normal life too, which is quite sort of demanding, even in lockdown. And so once I started to feel like the blog is needed because people are wanting it and people sending messages at five o'clock and saying we haven't got it yet, where is it? That was quite a big pressure. But um, I mean, it's just like normal life, really. I just kind of I always have to come to my office to write, like even at office in inverted commas. And I kind of set aside a time and I just did most of it in my head. And then it's, I say, okay, at this time, I'm going to sit down and write the blog. Because if I don't organize it, it won't happen. Even, or it will happen, but you know, it's going to happen late in the evening and people are going to be nagging me. And they, even if they were going to nag me, I think it's really important, like with everything, I mean, to just uh, set a time and say, that's when I'm going to do it. But I always tell people because about writing, I'm doing commercial writing rather than writing books, but that you know, you don't just write it, do you? I mean, my mind is most of it is 24 hours of thinking and then an hour of writing. So while I was writing and walking miles to the supermarket every day or doing whatever I was doing, I'm um, thinking about the blog. So when I sat down, I could just do it. And it then flew out of my fingers quickly. Thank you. I, I, yes, I do that. What about you, Doreen? Um, because I was traveling um, a lot during uh, the compilation, let's call it, of Life in the Camel Lane. Um, it was very distracting, you know, because we love the city of Brussels. We were there for a month and we had a fabulous dog and a, an amazing family. They were caretaking their home. And, and we were in such a, I wanted to write about that because it's in the moment, because my writing is much better in the moment. Um, so I have learned that wherever I am to do slow matting, so I'm a slow nomad now. And that by slowing down my nomadic life to be a slow mad, I am finding that I can actually put more intention and more focus into the writing. And so I get up every morning, uh, well, I get up two or three mornings a week and I write for an hour or so. Um, and also, Sam, I, and I have a chair back at my home base in Colorado. So when I'm in Colorado, I have this blue suede chair. And when I sit in it and I put on the right music, that immediately uh, triggers. So I think it's um, getting all the mental triggers lined up in your head. The thinking part, as both Joes have mentioned, the um, preparation part, and then just getting yourself uh, very centered and in alignment, like we do when we do a yoga pose. We writers have to do that. Mm, that's a great, that's very helpful. What about you, Margaret? I uh, definitely agree. For me, it really, once I got to the point where I was actually writing the book, I was very, very determined. So I had a certain time during the morning, then I would take a walk, have a healthy lunch, get back to work. I mean, I was really on it. And so I would, someone told me one time, it's like, you have to treat yourself like one of your favorite dogs, sit, stay. <laughs> and that really worked for me because I was like, I have to get this dog on book done. So I agree with everyone else. It's getting ourselves in the mindset. And Joe, to your point, I love to take walks. A lot of stuff does come to me then. Some stuff comes to me in the middle of the night. A good girlfriend of mine said, my creative process, she said, that I'm like a chicken. She said, you are all paka, 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 which is evidently how chickens sound to her. Paka, 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 egg. And that's true for me. I do a lot of percolating and a lot of paka, 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 evidently, and then egg. So, yes. But mostly for me, it's just my butt in the chair. Yeah, that's so helpful, isn't it? So helpful. Um, Monty wants to know, is, is are we okay if she takes a screenshot of this and puts it on uh, social media, We're talking about learn moires and blocks. We've also got slow mad now as well. Right. <laughs> That's another great one. Um, so do you mind? 
You've no. done that? No? Oh, oh great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine has shared the organized writer as being something very useful. Hmm. And um, so that's got to the end of the question. So I'm just going to say thank you and stop the recording. And then if anybody wants to put their cameras on and have a little chat, that's welcome. So um, I shall just stop the recording now. And thank you, Joe, Doreen and Margaret very much indeed.